Shand, I am the least important person on this panel because I'm the moderator. <laughs> and I'm here to welcome you to the 50 Years of D&D, &D, the Forgotten Realms Seminar. So we will talk about anything and everything you want, realms-wise, and uh, get feedback from our much more famous and interesting panelists here. Okay. One. You go, Jim. Okay. I'm James Lauder. I was the series uh, fiction editor for the Forgotten Realms. Uh, around the time of Avatar, um, and uh, also worked on game material and comics uh, connected to the Forgotten Realms. I've also worked on Ravenloft and various other game and fiction and comics properties over the last mumble mumble decades. Uh, <laughs> and I'm Jeff Grubb. Uh, I've been working with Ed for Ever and a half, I was the individual who basically said, "Hey, Ed's got all this stuff. Let's see if you know he has a world behind it. Maybe we can publish it." <laughs> and that story will probably probably show up later again. But uh, I've worked on uh, Dragonlance, Forgotten Realms, Spelljammer, Alcadine, Marvel superheroes, a whole bunch of stuff in the '80s from uh, uh, TSR. Came back, worked with Wizards, um, had a long and colorful career with Ed over the years. And did short stories and novels and comic books. So. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. So um, I don't know how you want to tackle you're, this you're, first. Your panel. You're the moderator. Yeah, you're the moderator. Well, right. sir. Um, what's the first project that leaps to mind when you think of the Forgotten Realms and your oh, your work with it? <laughs> what was your first FR product? Um, the first the FR product one. I worked on was I think. Well, the first novel that I worked on was Spellfire. Okay. Um, I, I was a copy editor on Spellfire. Um, and then uh, I got dragged into working on Hall of Heroes, which I wasn't actually supposed to work on, but I foolishly went to the game division and said, hey, has anybody asked any of the fiction authors about these write-ups of their characters? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, cool. and of course they, what? We can do that? We can, books and games can talk? Um, and so I ended up uh, coordinating uh, some of the uh, uh, book authors, uh, Bob Salvatore and, and Doug, mm -hmm. to actually see the text uh, before it got published. And then uh, Scott Jensen and I ended up writing all of the Avatar characters because I had just been handed uh, as my very first full editorial experience uh, the Avatar trilogy, uh, which we can get into if somebody brings more alcohol. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first actual editing I did in the uh, book department as a story editor was doing the second pass on Jeff's uh, and Kate Novak's novel, Azure Bond. <laughs> way, way at the dawn of time. Right, uh, yes. And so so my, very early on. My first um, Realms product was, of course, the original Bright Box. Mm -hmm. And that was Ed and I teaming up. Um, I, I won't go back and do the secret history. Mm -hmm. like, many of you know this already, so yeah. please forbear. The Realms dates back to, uh, officially, to when uh, Ed was like nine years old. He wrote a short story called One Comes Unheralded to Zerta. And it was very much of the sword and sorcery. Elminster makes an appearance. There's magical cross-dressing. Uh, and this was like the first. And he was writing fiction based in this fantasy world. And when D&D &D came along, he started running his friends through the Forgotten Realms using uh, the D&D rule set. And, they, and at this point, he started writing uh, adventure, writing uh, articles for Dragon Magazine, where he'd write an article in which Elminster manifests in his kitchen and steals his beer and tells him about five magical books of the realms. And Kim Mohan would take out all the fluff and he'd, probably, he'd uh, publish five magical books of the realms. Mm -hmm. And this went on for some time until uh, Kim gave up and just started pu publishing the introductory material as well. And that's how everybody got introduced to Elminster. And um, I think he got hired on as a staff editor, uh, unpaid for Dragon right. Magazine. Right, I was a, I was a staff, unpaid staff editor as well. That was oh. to guarantee that we got, we would deliver a column of some type <laughs> every issue. I so need 300 words by Tuesday. <laughs> it, it pretty much, but we did get paid for the articles. We didn't get paid for the position. Yeah. Um, but in the wake of Dragonlance, there was honest to God some concern that Dragonlance is very good. What are we going to do next? 
you know, it's going to fade. It's going to fade. It's yeah. going to fade. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what are we else we're going to do? And I was the poor schmuck that basically said, um, Ed's written all these articles, all these articles. You know, maybe he has more of a world behind it. We can take a look at it and, and develop it. And uh, I, I said, that sounds great. Call Ed and see what he wants for, what wants for it. And, okay, I called Ed. He is, was and is a librarian in Canada, so I'm calling long distance. And they, uh, this is the first of many times I've dealt with the, their library front desk. Oh, yes. You know, after a while it was like, it's, it's him again. So, And we, uh, we, we chatted and I said, we'd like to buy you know, what you have on the room. And Ed said, well, you've printed my material. I thought you already owned it. I said, okay, we're not going to tell anybody you said that. <laughs> and we pay him a small amount of money, a Macintosh without a hard drive. Uh, a year later, because we liked him, we gave him a hard drive to go with it. So he was swapping discs for the first year. And a promise to publish you know, novels that he's, uh, that he's written. And this became the basis for what the Forgotten Realms Grey Box said. The Elminster's notes were often material that he just has four pages on Rashomon, you know, mm -hmm. and so basically we, we, you know, edited it down and basically, and then put some game lore in there as well. So that's why it's a team up between the two of us, because he's the architect of uh, the realms, and I'm just the engineer. I help, you know, basically put it together in such a fashion that people in, in the maps, he mailed us the maps. There were 20, of the, the maps of the world, there were 24, eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. And we had to tape it together, and we put, hung it on the wall. I and outside I, of Jeff's cube, right, in, in yeah. cube land in the game department in TSR. Because that's where we would end up arguing about where things yes. would go. And it was a hand-drawn map. So, you know, there's like a, an area, there's a location south of Waterdeep called Kavanaugh. And we've written about the, em the lost empire of Kavanaugh and you know all this underground stuff. Actually, the type the line was supposed to be cave mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't get everything. That map, by the way, is at the Game Hole, which is a gaming yes. uh, uh, group up in Madison, hanging from their yeah. ceiling. So that's where that's ended up. So we we had to assemble that. Mm -hmm. I'm giving the secret origins. There's the man whose Hi, penmanship sir. led to many new things they weren't expecting. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, folks. It's okay, we're in the hidden realm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, no, so, no, and, and the fiction program started <laughs> off again by a mm -hmm. book that was... Oh, God, yes. You, you <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, you were involved. So. Yeah, well, kindly. <laughs> um, in the wake of Dragonlance, TSR UK wanted to do its own Dragonlance. And they got Doug Niles was going to write the novel. Uh, and halfway through writing the novel, they shut down TSR UK. <laughs> so, the, so he had a half-written novel, and Ed and I were working on the gray box. And so we redrew the uh, moonshakes, which originally were going to be like an archipelago, like an Earthsea type uh, construct, and basically put in this giant England, which was, which was the Moonshay Isles. So our first book, which actually came out like a month before the Grey Box, so it's actually the first Forgotten Realms product, was uh, a book that had been written initially. And this kind of worked for uh, Forgotten Realms, because Forgotten Realms was intended to be the world where you could put everything. Right. You know, uh, we had some orphan products like uh, Pharaoh, uh, mm -hmm. That basically didn't have like they didn't belong to Greyhawk, they didn't belong under Ilfarn, right. they didn't belong uh, belong to any particular area. So they found a place in the realms. So the realms became just this Hoover uh, vacuum and, and of, of sucking up all these other. You and, know, and that became the world's strength, and, yes. and why it grew so quickly yeah. and became so diverse because. You could have Bob Salvatore come up with the character Drisk in yes. Ten Towns, mm -hmm. and then that gets grafted onto the world as well. Mm -hmm. But it also leaves Bob uh, room for it to be his character with authorial voice. Right. And mm -hmm. the fiction line has uh, P.G. Wodehouse jokes in, in Azure mm -hmm. Bond mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Scott C. Ensign doing his Clive Barker riff in the, in the <laughs> Harper's novel he wrote. I thought he was doing manly way well. Man. No, no, it was, no, it was super Clive Barker. Right? Un un unreliable narrators are our friends. Yes. Uh, but it, it was one of the great things. Dragonlands, 
for all its strength, I always described it as a tree because we have the epic. Right. Yeah. And the further away you get from the epic, the weaker things feel because you know you got the heroes, you got strong characters, strong motivations. Yep. But it's this good solid center, mm -hmm. and the realms is much more of a bush. That Bob's over here, and Ed's over here, mm -hmm. and you know Doug's over over here. I originally had a small version of the world map with territories carved out. <laughs> if you're going to the moonshade, <laughs> talk to Doug. Right. If and and when and when fiction when we started putting together series like the Harpers and and I had taken over so. There were three parts to the fiction line uh, when I came in. Doug had started his stuff, Bob mm -hmm. had started his stuff, mm -hmm. and then I got sort of all the other stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> so Bill Larson was Doug's editor, and Eric Severson was Bob's editor, and then I became the editor for all of the other forgotten the swing, roles. The swing shift editor. But yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Avatar, it, it'll be really easy, no problem. Oh, we'll give it to now. the new guy. And so one of the things that we, oh, yeah, exactly. Um, Jeff, it is the one thing that I, I actually s still wish I had for my office at TSR. In the middle of the Avatar project, Jeff drew a stick figure Jim Louder in the middle of this vortex and oh said, God. Avatar <laughs> yes. vortex, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, yeah. and hung it on my door. I came in one day or woke up from under my desk. Um, to, I, I, to find I, 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 I defy you to prove that. Yeah. <laughs> I also did not give you the toy chainsaw. So. That's true. No, okay. no, no one gave me that. Yeah. Um, we did it, me, so it's not my fault. Yeah, all right, exactly. <laughs> um, so when we would add new uh, books that were uh, covering new regions of the world, we would go up to the map yep. and we would have this this discussion. Hallway discussion. Where Dark do we board. Where do we want to shift this that isn't being covered by other writers to leave people that room to be creative and to add things to the world? And early on, we had licensed uh, out particular chunks of the right. realm. Right. Yep. Uh, the spine of the world went to like CompuServe, you mm -hmm. know, and Baldur's Gate had its own, you know, right. it, it, that's the start of the whole Baldur's Gate series. Mm -hmm. And uh, Neverwinter uh, basically went out to a, a computer company as well. Yep. And <laughs> it, it created that ha tri challenge sometimes because, okay, Bob wants a, you know, snowy, wintry, uh, uh, arctic, you know, place for 10 towns, mm -hmm. and we're looking all along the top row and everything given out, all the pieces, right. and we end up in the upper left-hand corner in a little bit of the map that we extend <laughs> out, and that's where 10 towns ended up. <laughs> right. So. Well, yeah, you guys stretched out the Great Glacier to fit in Doug's other we miniatures. Cu we right? cut it back. Yeah. The H oh. series was already started. <laughs> That's one of our orphans that we adopted. This was the high-level D&D, and it used Battle System, which Doug Niles created. Mm -hmm. And it basically, we rolled the Great Glacier. The Great Glacier rolled, was much further south, ended much further south. Nice. And we rolled that back to create some territory. For this. Mm -hmm. So I told him about uh, one comes on travel to, uh, to Zerta. And I told him about our early encounters. <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't told him about, about all the shipments. I've told him about the 24 pages, but not <laughs> the whole packages that arrived from Canada. So, you know. Wrapped in tinfoil and plastic and <sighs> ink. And, and these, <laughs> these saddists would give it to the youngest guy. Yeah, I'm not the youngest gets, guy, but. They just giggled. And yes. half an hour went <laughs> by. <laughs> the, uh, no, you see, here's the thing. Okay, go for it. In an early Gen Con in Mecca, I attended one of those in the quad, one of those cute little seminars run by Steve Witter. If you'd like to write for TSR, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he would hold up an eight inch floppy with three staples through it yeah. and say, please do not staple <laughs> your manuscript to your manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> because where these holes are and these big hunks of metal are, becomes unreadable. Please protect your discs. And he'd hold up an eight-inch flop and it would bend in half, like a like it was a greeting card. He'd say, this is also hard for our machines to read. <laughs> and how many of you actually remember discs bigger than... Yes. Yeah. 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 The, the other thing that's, yeah. that's, that's kind of remarkable about this is TSR among publishers was ahead of the curve mm -hmm. for using computers mm -hmm. and, and accepting manuscripts uh, on, on disk. Mm. 
And so we, we also were not New York Publishing. We were right. building it up from the ground, right, as yeah. it were. Mm -hmm. So we did not know, you know, what is the way we're going to do things. So they were inventing <laughs> stuff as they went along. When right. Jeff called me at the library, it was a long distance call. Yes, it was. <laughs> there was a budget that could not be exceeded. I worked in a tiny public library in a large city in Canada, so we had a teleprinter machine because libraries had teleprinter machines mm -hmm. to cross the great frozen north. <laughs> <laughs> there was a teleprinter machine and a shipper in O'Hare Airport. So if somebody wanted to real time, yeah. they would have to drive from Lake Geneva, <laughs> down to O'Hare Airport, walk in, say, can I have you to two hours <laughs> <driving? laughs> <laughs> And he took to me. One of the revolutions we had while we were uh, doing design work was the rise of Federal Express. Yes. <laughs> and the ability to get things uh, over several days <laughs> as opposed to oh, several weeks oh, unless they oh, disappeared oh. in customs. Can I tell the FedEx story now? You can tell the FedEx story okay. now. Okay. <laughs> so, I don't think trip. anyone can sue us about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the second package I sent Jeff in 1986 is still on the way. Yes. <laughs> do you have the, the tracking number? I was going to say. No, 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 no. <laughs> this was by mail. Yeah, okay. And when that happened, that's when Jeff said, I've been entrusted to give you the company's FedEx account number. <laughs> yeah. So, because I happened to work in a public library, so during daylight hours, because I lived in the country, FedEx didn't know anything about the country. Mm -hmm. If you FedEx something to me in the country, they got it to a city that was about an hour away, and they just handed it to the local post office to do the last, so I mean, <laughs> yeah, the last mile. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there was no savings and no security. But so every day during working hours, I was at the library. So I called from a public library to FedEx. Three handsome young guys in the shortest of shorts, knife edge creases, full FedEx uniforms, white sneakers gleaming, came in the door in unison, <laughs> boxes, waybills, waybill ovens oaks. Sir, how can we help you? Here, we are FedEx in this huge glossy catalog. And I said, oh, okay, right. Our pickup times are this, and our pickup times are this. We don't pick up Saturdays or Sundays, goodbye. Oh. So, uh, which won me an awful lot of design days. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then I would remember Steve Winter's floppies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would do a manuscript. And I would photocopy it on the library's photocopier, realizing how expensive this was. <laughs> I was getting it for free, but you know, realizing how expensive it was supposed to be. And then I would take cardboard from notepads, and then I would take baggies, and I would baggy my floppy, which by oh. then was the hard, short, small floppy, and I'd take it shut, and I'd wrap it in tin foil. Space mm -hmm. Then I <laughs> put these cardboard things in a thingy, and I take it shot four ways. And then and, I would and all three of us are getting these flashbacks. Oh yeah. God! Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's why they're looking rather ill. And then he hasn't yeah. even gotten to wrapping things in cellophane yet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so then, then I go to the library. I have been unbagging because magazines came in plastic bags in those days because we actually cared about the condition they arrived in. So I would take all the empty clay plastic bags, which my job was to fold them and flatten them and fold them and flatten them so they would fit in the minimal garbage thing for the recycling. Mm -hmm. And I would take out the suitable ones, check them for little air holes, and I would package the thing and tape it <laughs> shut and tape it shut. And then I would sandwich it in the middle of the manuscript. And then I would take a heavy poly bag and package the manuscript. And then I would fold in all its knife edges yeah. and put glass filament tape around them to hold them in so they wouldn't cut the FedEx link. Mm -hmm. And then I would have my photocopied, looked like professionally printed address thingies, and I would address the plastic package as in if case. it was a letter in yeah. case it lost its back. Then I would put it in the FedEx, do the same thing with the FedEx thing, and then I would tape it shut three or four times, and then I would case it again. And the whole point of this was, when it hit customs, the customs agent would say, hmm, I need x-ray it, that's pretty heavy. Oh, it's something metallic inside. Oh, <laughs> okay. And, so, and it would go through. The whole point of it was to A, if, and by the way, the library received its own personalized mail delivery. And we watched 
the driver of the mail van, drive all over our parking lot looking for a puddle. And when he found one that was six inches deep, he dropped the mail bag into it and <laughs> left. So we were used to that. So I was guarding against those two things, little realizing I was driving <laughs> us mad. <laughs> this little so, so you, you've heard him now describe how he wrapped it. Mm -hmm. Imagine being on the other end, the package arrives, and you start unwrapping. Yes. And you keep unwrapping. <laughs> and you're trying to do it in a way that you're not going to damage the disc or the pages inside. Yeah, exactly. Because exactly. By the time I came along in, in early 1990, it, it was a game at that point. Somebody, <laughs> you would be, mail call comes in, it hits the desk, and somebody stands up, hey, package from Ed, time me. <laughs> I bet oh. eight minutes and 17 seconds to get it all unwrapped. I, I, I had the unwrapped stuff, and Ann Brown, who was the editor over the cube wall, after about five minutes would say, that's another package from Ed, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. here today, if you wish. She is. Yeah. The she's, running, she's running the So, uh, so the, the other thing about this is, uh, you know, this is all pre-internet, yeah. pre-Zoom. Uh, mm. So, you know, one of the other things that happened, I lived up by Milwaukee, not down in Lake Geneva, like most of the staff. So if we missed the FedEx drop in Lake Geneva, I would have to drive 9,000 miles an hour up Highway 43 in Wisconsin <laughs> to drop it at the last possible time at the FedEx at the Milwaukee airport. And this was magic. It this was. was. This <laughs> was amazing, uh, you know, as opposed to what, and we had the reverse problem when we would ship him samples and books. <laughs> the, they would stop at customs for about a month, right? <laughs> and then they would be passed on and, and would get them, and there'd be one copy that had been read. And the spine was broken. And sometimes there was a review tucked in the <laughs> <laughs> So that's yeah. what, the, you know, what the Canadian uh, Customs yeah. was doing. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, 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 they know him after a while. Yeah, so. they, they knew me. But, but then Gary was the same. When he was starting D&D, and the first shipments out mm -hmm. were going out to General Mitchell Field in Milwaukee right. in uh, Pete's Freight. Right. And Pete's <laughs> Freight was full of stuff made in Lake Geneva being shipped out all across the nation. And it was full, this little cube van. And mm -hmm. Gary would pay Pete in beer, and Pete would take one box for one hobby store of D and D stuff and shove it under his seat in the front cab of the van. And <laughs> so this was a time-honored tradition. Oh. Yeah, that's how Dungeons and Dragons reached the world. <laughs> okay. yeah. we, we had boxes of books that showed up at the local half-price bookstores over the years. Too. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, things that fell off the printer. There was one. This was a Dragonlance story. There was a couple <coughs> of Dragonlance uh, <laughs> short stories, and there was a misprint in there. And the misprint involved they reprinted uh, a story by Margaret Weiss again on the and on the last page. So you know the it, the last story didn't make sense because suddenly there was this reprint material. So they pulped the run. And then we got a fan letter from somebody who said, oh, I really like your short stories. But uh, the one at the end didn't make any sense because it repeated, and you, you know there was an error. We thought, we caught all that before it was <laughs> shipped out. And so we, we contacted the guy in the half-price bookstore that he uh, uh, worked at, happened to be in the same community as the printer. Okay, and we called the half-price bookstore and we said, who's selling you these boxes of, of, of TSR books? And they told us. And we, had, we, we paid them a little visit, you know, uh, through, through the, like, don't do this. You know, we, we, we dropped a dime on them. No Pinkertons were involved. This is before. Call the guy's boss and say, hey, you know, you got somebody who's taking stuff that's fallen off the truck. Yeah. So... <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so the, the other part of this, as, as the fiction line takes off, um, there was all kinds of cooperation between Ed and games mm -hmm. and, and fiction, which was kind of, when I got hired by TSR, I was a gamer who also had the literary background, mm -hmm. and they, that was the intent for what my role was going to be, was working on those things. So when we start on Avatar, <laughs> Uh, Zeb Cook is writing <coughs> the second edition rules as the novels are being written because right. Avatar is supposed to explain the change from first to mm -hmm. second edition realms. Uh, Ed is getting notes, Jeff is getting notes. We're all doing this all in real time. Uh, I'm getting yelled at for spending too much uh, uh, long distance phone calls yeah. to edit the library. <laughs> the book department has a budget, you know. 
Uh, and and uh, I, have, I have already zeroed out the library's medicinal rum budget. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Uh, but the the uh, innovative part about all of that was how much collaboration there actually was between the departments, mm -hmm. and Ed, especially in all of this, being incredibly generous, letting other creators take corners of the world mm -hmm. and develop them. And, and by the same token, somebody would come into the library with one of the new products that just been released and, uh, and, and, and ask for an autograph. And Ed was like, ooh, this is interesting. You mind if I read it first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't read it yet. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen this one yet. No, right. well, author copies, <laughs> author copies took the slow road. Mm -hmm. I think the Pony Express was still operating. Uh, <laughs> both, both, both male Pony oh, Express. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but by the time I showed up, I thought that the way you got your author copies was you just filled up your van once a year when you came to TSI for Jenkins. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I pretty much did mm -hmm. because everything I missed receiving, except Swords of Dragonfire, I never did get that. Um, oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, a whole case of author copies never happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't think we have them anymore. No, no, I don't think so either. Yeah. I, I did ask at one point. <laughs> um, you know, I said, hey, come on, multi million dollar corporation. Surely you've got a warehouse or two I could raid. <laughs> well, we do have a warehouse. We yeah. have, the Sheridan <laughs> Springs office had like the largest oh, warehouse yeah. in Southeast with, yeah. uh, Wisconsin. You know, that was that was a brag. Yeah. If you walked out of the Dungeon Order Hobby Shop, you were on one of those little landings. <laughs> yes. With a steep stair down, and about the eighth level of the forklift thingies was at your eye level. The last uh, scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, that's what we had there, and we had all sorts of stuff stacked and hidden in that in that mm -hmm. warehouse. Nice. Uh, materials from uh, demos, uh, parts of the castle, you know. I think that, this was back when uh, uh, Gen Con was in Milwaukee, which was you know, about an hour's drive away mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lake Geneva. So we would often, you know, basically commute in to Gen Con. As opposed to you know, uh, as opposed to having rooms up there. So yeah, we, we T TSR in. actually ran the whole convention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know, the the warehouse department was doing the ticket desk. Yes, mm -hmm. and so and, and they, our CFO was doing was looking over the cash box. Right. The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, so and one year they splurged and gave me a hotel room in the Hyatt. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I usher my wife into the hotel room and she says. I love the decor, and the hotel room has, you walk in, there's a bathroom to the side, and there's yeah. two beds, and then there's the long wall, that has the big TV and a completely useless bureau thing, you know, for your clothes. <laughs> well, that was covered floor to ceiling with a wall of boxes of TSR stock, <laughs> <laughs> because, that, because the room was going to be used as a stage Storage, area. Yeah. And, oh, I'm and, sorry. No, no, no. I didn't mind. I, I thought it was cool. Oh, yeah. I was going to open them all, and Jed said, <laughs> no. don't you dare. You'll get in so much trouble. And I said, but it won't be anything to the trouble. You'll land on some guy when he opens the door and comes into the room at 3 in the morning when you're asleep to take the boxes. And he goes, <laughs> You leave that to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I> man. <laughs> uh, early Gen Cons. It was, and of course, I met uh, Ed in the flesh at one of those Gen Cons. Because <laughs> when you worked for TSR, you were told you're not taking vacation during Gen Con week. You're coming and working Gen Con. And right, working yeah. Gen Con means you're running demos, you're running seminars, and you're also building the uh, uh, the booths and <laughs> yep. So I'm I'm sitting there holding up one end of a, of a rafter, you know, it's basically for for the booth at the time. And Ed Ed's at the other end, you're know, holding up his people, waiting for a tool to show up, you know, that sort of thing. And you know, I'm saying, okay. And I said, oh, hi there. I'm, I'm my name's Jeff Grubb. I mean, you know, I go, oh, I know you. <laughs> says Ed. We've been talking together for the last yeah. six months, you know, and that's how I met Ed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> while building the TSR booth. Yeah, nice. So, okay, how about we uh, open this up for questions? Uh, what do you okay. folks want to know? Yeah, well, we've, we've done a lot of prehistory yeah. here, and there's been a lot of, you know, how the uh, uh, game evolved, the world evolved, the various uh, uh, revisions, 
the sundering, you know, various what we used to call world shattering, uh, gl uh, world realms, realm shattering. shattering events. Yes, R S E. You can hear it in yeah. the background. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Avatar coming to get me again. <laughs> Avatar was very successful, and it was the idea of doing this big epic, you know. Up, up to now, up to then, we were doing uh, Bob stories were over here, and right. Doug stories were over here. We wanted to do something big and epic, and that became the Avatar series. And, and the, the and crazy, the crazy part, it did. And and Waterdeep, the third Avatar novel, was the first New York Times bestseller for the Forgotten Realm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was actually, as I said, this was my first professional as the lead editor for a fiction project, that was my first project. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all three novels are being written by three different authors in three different time zones at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, things like Hall of Heroes are being done where they're asking, the game department asks for, hey, what's the backstory for this Siric character? Well, <laughs> Scott and I will make it up uh, <laughs> on the fly. Yeah, and I, oh, I, by I, the I, way, I we're- comics. Where, uh, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Oh, by the way, DC's doing these comics. We're going to tie into those, and we have miniatures and yeah. where'd louder go? But as uh, but as a result of this, we then got ourselves into this habit of saying we've got to do something big, right? Every mm -hmm. every year, so we had right. the discovery of Mastika, and, and, we and had empires, empires, and, we yep. had the yeah. with crusade and everything. We had the Mongol hordes arrive. Uh, there was a threat from the sea. Threat from the sea was you another know, one. So, yep. it, it, yep. so there was a lot of that sort of, you know, like, what's, what's the big annual? Right, type exactly. Of thing, I built this beautiful world. <laughs> and they set about destroying property values everywhere. Every yeah. <laughs> 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 right so, yeah. Yep. Hey, Jeff, um, I, somebody kind of spilled the beans on this uh, yesterday for me. Uh, tell me about Geoji Wyvernspur. That was to be my daughter's favorite character in uh, the realm. Yes. Uh, but somebody told me that, that that has a special connection to you. Uh, well, Joji first shows up in Azure Bonds. He is an upper class twit, and uh, basically, who can, within the story, could um, do a, a fair imitation of King Azuma. And basically, he becomes the trigger because uh, Alias was, you know, programmed to attack King Azu, and she hear he hears she hears Azu's voice, and she goes after Joji. And Joji was uh, very much based on Bertie Wooster from the PG Woodhouse, and this is what we're talking about: different voices and different approaches. Mm -hmm. So he's very much that upper class drones club type uh, mm -hmm. twit, and, and you know, so he, and he, he worked out. He was a sweet character, and we ended up um, when. We were talking with Mary, the head of the book department, about what are we going to do next. She want, really wanted to see, let's do another, do a Joji book. Let's not worry about Alias, let's do a Joji book. And so we did a Joji book, that was the Wyvern Spur. Then went back to Alias for after, after that. And Joji over time grew up and, you know, basically became a, a reasonable human being. So I had to create another upper class twit when I was writing short stories because Joji was there. And that, that's, that's our story on Joji, because at that time, you know, um, this was right before the whole, um, what are the actors uh, that did the, Hugh, Hugh Laurie uh, oh, and, and, Stephen and, Stephen and Stephen Fry. And Stephen Fry. Yeah. This is before they did their uh, the BBC, thing, and it became the, much more popular. Yeah. So basically we had these little penguin books of, uh, right. of old uh, Bertie, uh, old Woodhouse stories. And I still read them. I still enjoy them. They're, they're, they're very much popcorn. And it's often uh, often the plot of this, and the plot of most of the short stories I later wrote about Tertius was Bertie does something that Jeeves does not approve of, mm -hmm. like wearing purple socks, or playing the banjo, uh, or growing a mustache. And then Bertie gets into trouble, and the only way out of the trouble that Jeeves <coughs> saves him involves breaking the banjo, or yeah. him having to shave the mustache. And so basically, Jeeves always wins. And though Bertie tries to, you know, basically assert his uh, uh, positive. That's a different tone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That no, worry, it hasn't okay. collapsed yet. Okay. All right. Two, right here. Okay. Uh, oh. To Mr. Greenwood, uh, since Manga Boys and Fresh Human are already publishing new books, is there any chance that we get a new El Mister book in the future? There is always a chance. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I have no um, inside pipeline to the levers of power. My mind reading abilities 
are fading fast. <laughs> and I literally can't tell you of any super secret project that is about to hit the bestseller list tomorrow. There isn't one. Okay? There's always a chance. Certain people in this room have been working hard at getting new realms fiction for a long time. It's it's an uphill battle. How many more cliches can I spew? I know, right? <laughs> so, so right now, Wizards Fiction Program is very limited. They're right. doing some magic fiction uh, that they're publishing, but otherwise, it's licensed to big publishers. So the the new Margaret Tracy books, Bob Salvatore's, well, it's licensed to those authors, effectively. Well, and, and yeah. I, that's what I was just going to say is those authors have helped arrange with those publishers for those books to happen. Right. So Margaret, Tracy, and Bob wow. had enough clout for those projects to happen. Wizards beyond that isn't really doing a lot of active licensing. Right. Because for a publisher to take a license like that is a big leap and very expensive. So they need to be guaranteed a certain sales level uh, to do just cold realms fiction. That's more of a risk. Yeah, so and, and also approvals. Which means right. somebody mm -hmm. has to do it. You right. know, somebody in the office has to read the, uh, the latest yeah. and, and make sure and that it lines up with everything they're, they're doing they, with, and they with the rest. The staff they use. And they don't have the staff to do that. That's so uh, the, well. the, the trick is going to be to get both Wizards and another publisher to put together a proposal mm -hmm. that is attractive enough mm -hmm. for, the other, for everybody to say yes. And, and I'll be frank, it's often the writers who are making the drive forward Correct. to uh, and, basically and, get those things And so, in. you know, is that possible? Yes. Is it theoretically possible? Yes. Is it more possible now than it's been in 20 years? Yes. Mm -hmm. So... Does that mean it's going to happen tomorrow? It does mean it's going to happen, <laughs> not until the deal is signed and the books come out. Right. Thank you. Okay. Next question. In the green shirt, then the person in the back. Thanks. Between things like Bob Salvatore's books and video games like Baldur's Gate 3, have any of the projects taking place later on in Forgotten Realms surprised you? Do you have any favorites? I love the movie. <laughs> the movie's excellent. I, I did a lot of that, you know, Leo DiCaprio. <laughs> I recognize that. Okay, I got that reference, you know. It was, it was a good movie, and I think it, I think it was a good, good yeah. Realms movie. I've watched it seven times now, and it stands up to being rewatched okay. that many times. So, so the, uh, but as far as surprises are concerned, uh, they had a product where they were sending Baldur's Gate into hell. I think that I think, really okay. This is <laughs> what they've been doing in uh, a lot of the fifth edition materials are big epic projects, so, you know, big hardback type stuff, and they've concentrated primarily on the Sword Coast area. Right. As far as the area, I'd like to see them you know, spread back out and you know, yes. and see some of some of the territory that we've been you know quietly putting out to pasture for a while because the realms has been uh, a default D and D universe. And you know, basically, how everything fits in. The, I'm impressed with how uh, things do fit in neatly with the realms. Uh, back at TSR, I had a boss that came into my office and said, "You know, people like zeppelins. Do we have zeppelins in the realm?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "I'll check." And I called up Ed Long Distance and said, "Okay, you're not going to believe what this one." But, he, but they want to know about zeppelins in the realms. Oh. You must mean the skyships of Alrua, <laughs> which I talked about in Dragon Magazine number one fifty five. Yeah, yeah, we've already covered this. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, to, I got, to, got you know, dug out the issue, and I went down to my boss. And, Here, we got it. So you know, and uh, because he just, he was just pulling something out of his hat. He was, he was like, okay, fine. The, the, we don't necessarily know anything that's going on. I mean, you know, when the new products come out, they're not consulting everybody. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of surprises. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are positive, some of them aren't. Um, I, I, I've been surprised. What a diplomat. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you adopted he's, Dragon Base. He's better rested than he once right, was. Right, yes, and so that's, <laughs> that's great, actually, great so a character <laughs> I created and a character Jeff created right. are palling around in chum. 
made me happy that okay. our artist in there was hanging around with, with Dragon Bait. Mm -hmm. But it was a surprise to yeah. both of us that they made minis and... Oh yeah, the minis, and that's all. I didn't know they were, they, that they were doing that. They, and, right. And, and, so no, no one told me. So the, and I, I actually... Three miles away from Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. You know? so, so I did Thank hear ahead of time as they were working on Tomb of Annihilation, which is uh, derived largely uh, parts of it from uh, The Ring of Winter, the novel I wrote, and Jungles of Chelts, the, the uh, game material I wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard ahead of time that it was happening enough, and I asked the right way with magic words that I got to review. Nothing. in. The, the, yes, I got to I got to review the hardcover ahead of time for the specific things, Artist Simbear and Mesro, mm -hmm. and some of the material, and. With that, I got to actually save the city of Mesro, which um, that was the big surprise that it actually worked. I got it, I tried it and it worked uh, because Mesro had been destroyed in fourth edition, and, and that was a city I had created. And I convinced them to add a line into the Tomb of Annihilation source book that says it actually hadn't been destroyed. Obteo slipped it into a demi plane, okay, so it was saved. And I, when I gave them the, the change, I actually put on the editor hat too and said, and if you delete these two lines later on, which are easily deletable, you actually don't have to reset this page. It will, you don't have to <laughs> retype set anything. It just fits right there. And they included it in there, and creators have gone through with the DM skill and done all kinds of really cool things with Mesro, which makes me very happy. You must use this power only for good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Sundering was a surprise. Right. I mean, oh, really? Li yes. Literally, the first entry in um, the Realm Cyclopedia is a beer Turil, which is the name of the planet. And Turil was actually the name of my campaign. And we wanted it to be the first, uh, the first uh, entry so we gave it a beer, a B. So basically, that became our first entry on on the time. But it was a keyboard bash. It was I was making up a word, mm -hmm. and later on they decided, well, there was Toril over here, and there was a beer over here, and now we're going to mesh them ba both back together again. <laughs> I go, okay, that's interesting. I think they've taken them apart. And they I sort of did a think reset. so. Yeah, and that was where Mesro got wiped out. I think yeah. was when that happened. Yeah. Uh huh. So they've been putting things back together and they have like, you know, the dimensions where it didn't really fit. And they still have some stuff in Anorak, mm -hmm. right, there, which yeah. wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. It was all just mm -hmm. sanded, buried cities that nobody had ever seen. They there. had a secret summit and yeah. flew us all out there. And they bought us pizza. Well, <laughs> again, three miles away and no one talked to me. Yes. 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 I live way far away and I didn't even hear about yeah. the meeting, so. Yeah. I, I, I usually find out about the secret summits because Ed calls and calls up and says, "Hey, I'm down to, down at the uh, hotel. You want to want to go for a drink?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so out of all of the things now, what we're hoping, and and again, this is something that is always possible. One of the hallmarks of how the realms was put together, even if everybody didn't agree on the direction, right, was there was cooperation. Uh, between all of us, that yep. Ed got calls, and, and Jeff and I spent a lot of time with Karen and, and the other people, and Stephen and the other people working yep. in the department, uh, building the realms together mm -hmm. and involving the other creators as much as possible. It was a cooperative venture. It was a, it, yeah. and it was a massively cooperative venture, but and that was the to, best part about it. You, if you have to best describe it in metaphorical terms, you are driving precious cargo at high speed along an internet <laughs> and the engine has broken and various people are being called on to climb out on the speeding vehicle, lift the hood and fix it while it's in motion. Right. And they've never worked on this field before so they call some guy in Canada and says, I'm staring at this thing that I think is a fan belt <laughs> and this guy in Canada who has never seen this vehicle either, but is safely a country away, says, oh, don't worry about that. What you have to worry about is the red button. Just don't press the red button. Yeah. Okay, press the red, the red button. button. This yeah. one? Yeah. <laughs> you see, and I, I always describe the fact that we're laying track, and behind us we hear the sound of the engine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The train yes. Was that was, and so we start laying track. That was, that, was all, that was always true, especially with uh, the, yeah. the tight deadlines and the schedules. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that was, was the difference. When you had the diff when you had a decent deadline, it was the hey, let's to get together and have a drink and talk about this, mm -hmm. as opposed to you have the real deadline, which is hey, you're going to want to get a drink before we talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more question. Yeah, yeah. 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 we're yeah. running yeah. out of time. Follow, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, reactions to seeing the movie on big screen. I mean, this is the vision of what was started in the early 80s and yes. now, I mean, worldwide, $150 million film, mm -hmm. and it's your world, and it's exposed to the entire world, right. and there might be a second one. In the we so hope, yeah. So what your thoughts yeah. were on that, on that, on that event? What's this sure, let, let me future? just go from the start. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I had to take my library ladies to see it. Oh, Ed's movie, Ed's world. Let's go. In one of those nice cinemas where they give you the leather chairs that you could just like yeah. live in. You know? <laughs> and we went at a time that nobody else was going to see it because of the time of day we went. And so they were, knowing we had an empty theater. They didn't invite you to the premiere? Oh, God, no. <laughs> um, I, I have a story, but I'll save that for later. Um, so, but they were in an empty theater, so they could say, "So, what's that? What's that?" Without bothering other moviegoers. So, except that was you, yeah, yeah, except me, yeah. And I'm going, um, and I really enjoyed it. I then had to take the ladies who used to work at the library, who run my local indie bookstore, and get me all my stuff because they wanted to see it. And then I had to take my boarders to see it. And then I had to take my family, and I, I kept enjoying it. And I will tell you. It's visually gorgeous. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you stop and freeze frame and look at stuff, there's real work has gone into throne rooms and tapestries mm -hmm. and stuff, and it is beautiful. Um, it's full of in jokes, uh, like the um, mm -hmm. portrait of Volo, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and and th that are obvious and in world stuff. Um, it is true to the spirit of D and D in that the dungeon master has a prepared story and the player characters are going to say, that's beautiful, we're going over there instead. <laughs> All that stuff. And it has this light, jaunty, ironic tone, uh, which we've also seen in Deadpool movies when they break the fourth wall and so on, that appeals to people who aren't necessarily fans of that brand. They right. may not know anything about that, but they like it because it's a nice journey and it's a nice time spent with good company of characters, mm -hmm. and it has all the obvious in-jokes. It, 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 has, it has threat, but not, so, not necessarily a world-shaking threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has the sense of humor, mm -hmm. I think, that's very key to being in the realms as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a good feel for that. And the haughty paladin, played by the hot, hunky Bridgerton <laughs> star, <laughs> that was Drist's role. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were originally going to have Drist in there. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you know, Chris Pine's character, who uh, was married to the woman of color who quit the Harpers, was totally not Artis Simbear at one point in those drafts. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they made the right choice. I absolutely by agree. By not saying this is Ritz. It's yeah, and, and, and it's not Ritz. Yeah, I, I was very actually mm -hmm. happy for it. Yeah. I actually haven't seen the movie because Aww. they didn't credit Ed. I refuse to watch Aww. it. Aww. <laughs> Is 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 the the young wizard Elminster's grandson? No, uh, he's a he's a great 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 grandson of Elminster. That okay. is not Elminster when he's doing the. That's a mental thing. thing yeah. That's what he imagines Elminster. I, to be. I I just noticed oh, that whenever he speaks his okay. first name, the lips don't move. It's like they recorded yeah. it with yeah. one name and then they added another in yeah. oh, And yeah. that's the sort of thing I'm paying attention. Yeah, to. Yeah, right. yeah. We we deconstruct how yeah. a movie is made. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, camera shots. It's views. a yeah. yeah. I would watch that show of all you <laughs> doing movie reviews. <laughs> <laughs> the Mystery Science <laughs> Theater. Yes. 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 Oh, see yes. now yes. I would watch it for Can that. Can I play lower class <laughs> track <laughs> Bobo, please? Yes. yes. Yeah. You could get yeah. me to watch it to do that. Uh, we had one Is more question in the back you there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We we are we are at uh, ten minutes too. Yep. Oh, yeah. 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 Want us to get? Well, let's take that one real fast. Yep. What is a character or creature you think is brutally underrated in the world? Or under evil? Okay. Wow. Okay, let me let me answer this in a particular way. Okay. I think that two sorts of creatures are consistently misportrayed. Beholders, yes. who are supposed to be super genius, and what they what most people end up 
making them come across as his arrogant assholes with blind spots, mental blind spots, so they do stupid things. Right. They get taken. Yeah. Or dragons for the same reason. Yeah. They mm. become mm -hmm. egotistical punching bags who, when they're not asleep on their hoard, are conveniently leaving a, an Achilles heel for adventures, rather than, you know, we live an incredibly long time. We have a different view of the world than you mortals, and we're not going to sit there and duke it out with you. We're not interested, because we can fly. We'll take off, and then we'll wait until you're sleeping, and, poof, and then, then fly, it'll be a flyby. You know, we're not gonna stick around for the adventurers to do their, I'm gonna backstab the dragon. I mean, you see, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna agree with that, but yeah. only for the fact that the dragons, you know, it's not, it's not the dragon stories. The dragons are important to, mm -hmm. to the realms, but it's not the same sort of thing like they're, in, they're running it. If they were using their abilities to the full, there would be, it'd be a draconic run world. But they are in one kingdom, in two kingdoms in Laracon, yep. and in Murgom, okay. And which is far away from where we are. Yeah, yeah. that's the problem. Because every time I try and go in detail that and say, and here's the implications of when dragons are throwing their weight around. Oh, people aren't interested in that. It takes away agency from the players. That's, that's a challenge. <laughs> okay, we are, we are over time. Yep. And we are the next uh, session is here for comic, comic books. Yep. So those of you who want to hang, you can hang. Otherwise, yeah. Thank you all very much.